Hi class and welcome to the last video on the unit Chemistry of Life. So we're still sticking with Big Idea 2 and 4 looking at how living systems need energy, how they need matter, and how those um, systems are going to interact and they possess complex properties. And so this video we're going to highlight a type of uh, protein function and that is the function of enzymes. So enzymes are proteins which is a macromolecule we looked at um, last week in the last set of videos and they're really important in sort of the interactions of all of this matter that living systems need to grow and to reproduce. They couldn't do it without the function of enzymes. And enzymes also have to do a little bit with energy. So we're going to take a look at that in a second. So one of these enduring understandings that we're going to sort of carry across all of our units throughout the year is this idea of cooperation and competition. Both of these are actually important aspects to all biological systems. And specifically with enzymes, we're going to see that enzymes require cooperation between enzymes and substrates, but that sometimes in living systems, we actually do need competition. And this comes in the form of inhibitors of enzymes. And inhibitors we're going to look at, but they affect the structure and function of enzymes. And sometimes those are vitally important to maintaining homeostasis. So right now, at the molecular level, we're going to look at cooperation of enzymes and substrates and competition with inhibitors. And then later on, we're going to see how cooperation and competition exists with cells, organisms, and eventually at the end of the year in populations. So interactions between molecules affect their structure and function. So structure and function is still a huge theme here when we look at enzymes. Now all throughout your body there are chemical reactions going on because your body needs to take in that those elements from the environment. They need to build up those macromolecules and they also need to break down those macromolecules. And as that's happening, bonds are broken and they're reformed to make the products. And so this is a very common example of a chem chemical reaction that is occurring in inside of you right now. This is the chemical equation for cellular respiration. So your body takes in glucose from the food that you eat. You also breathe in oxygen from the air and we have a chemical reaction take place in the mitochondria of your cells that is going to release energy, water, and carbon dioxide. Um, but most reactions in your body, including this one, would take a very, very long time because they require a lot of starter energy to get, um, to get going. So they require an input of ATP in order to even start to break these bonds of glucose. So what does your body do? It can't just sit there and wait 10 years to break down a molecule of glucose. And the answer is your body has enzymes. So enzymes are biological catalysts. A catalyst is simply something that speeds up a reaction, and it's biological, meaning it's within a living system. And so enzymes function by lowering that initial amount of energy that's required to get that reaction started. And we call that the activation energy. So let's take a look at this graph here and see how enzymes work. Here are our reactants, so for example, that glucose and the oxygen, and here are our products. Well, without an enzyme, it's going to take a lot of energy to get that reaction started. But when we add an enzyme, a biological catalyst, it lowers the amount of energy required and therefore the reaction can proceed faster because we're not waiting around to build up that ATP energy. Um, so that's how enzymes function. They reduce that amount of activation energy. So enzymes are proteins, as I said before. They're substrate specific, meaning their active site will only recognize a very certain molecule or um, a substrate. And so let's take a look at where this is. This is a, the substrate molecule or the starting reactant. And then this here is the active site. So this is the part of the enzyme where the reactant or the substrate is going to bind. So notice how it's very specific. The structures must fit together, like a handshake, if you will. Enzymes are not used up in the chemical reaction. So once they do their thing, they can then be recycled and reused and do it again and again, as long as there's enough reactant and substrate to go around. Enzymes are usually named with the ending ASE. Don't confuse that with the carbohydrate ending of OSE. Uh, so for example, lactase is an enzyme that breaks down the sugar lactose. So usually the first part of the enzyme name is that substrate. 
So that's some basic information about enzymes. Now here's how enzymes work. So we're going to start over here. Here's our enzyme, our substrate. The substrate must fit perfectly in there. And then we have the enzyme substrate complex. So they're cooperating. There's some bond breaking that's happening here. It's sort of twisting and conforming that substrate. And then it's going to turn it into products. In this case, we've got two products that are coming out. And so they're going to leave that active site. And so there are a variety of shapes of enzymes in order to fit a variety of substrates in that living system. Now there are factors that affect enzyme function. It's not a perfect world, right? There are some other things going on. So we're going to take a look at each one of these factors that affect enzyme function, starting with cofactors and coenzymes. A cofactor is an inorganic helper molecule. So this is something that's not biological, not carbon-based. And it's going to bind to the enzyme and it's required for the enzyme to function correctly. Not all enzymes require cofactors, but some do. So for example, some kinases, uh, a kinase is something that's going to phosphorylate, add a phosphate. Uh, some kinases require the inorganic cofactors of potassium and magnesium. We're going to look more at kinases when we look at cellular communication um, versus a coenzyme. So a coenzyme is an organic helper molecule. So it is carbon-based. And it, again, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to bind to the enzyme, and it's required for that enzyme activity. And in cellular respiration, which is that equation I showed you in the beginning, um, a specific coenzyme called coenzyme A functions in one of those steps of cellular respiration. So these are just sort of helper molecules that help things get started. Let's take a look at a figure. So here's our enzyme. Here's our cofactor or our coenzyme. I don't know which one specifically we're looking at here. But it's going to bind to the enzyme and it's going to be required for it to function because you can see it's going to make its shape fit the shape of the substrate. So without this coenzyme, that shape would not be correct and the substrate would not be able to bind to the active site. So these guys help enzymes function. We also have enhancers and inhibitors. So enhancers are what they sound like. They're going to sort of bind and either reversibly or irreversibly, depending on the molecule, uh, to the active site or maybe somewhere else and they're going to make the enzyme stay in the active uh, form because it's an enhancer, or if it's an inhibitor, it would bind and make the enzyme inactive because it's inhibiting the enzyme. Um, so I, like I said, they can either bind directly to the active site or enhancers and inhibitors could bind to the allosteric site. Allosteric simply means it's not the active site. It's a site away from the active site. So enhancers are going to enhance enzyme activity, always make them function, and inhibitors are going to stop enzyme activity. So here's a figure. I know it's kind of confusing, but it really it does make sense, okay? So here's the active site. We have cofactors possibly binding. We obviously have the substrate binding. And then it, at a um, allosteric site, we could have enhancers or we could have inhibitors binding. So let's look at a real life example and we'll look more at this in class, but there might be an, an, an inhibitor in a chemical reaction and it might actually be the end product of that chemical reaction. So your body's going through and it's making a whole bunch of something, say product X. And product X builds up so much that it actually acts as an inhibitor and it goes back to the start of the enzyme and it says, stop making me enzyme, there's enough of me, there's enough product X, stop making me, stop wasting energy. So it would bind to the allosteric site of the enzyme, it would change the shape of the enzyme, and therefore it can no longer function, because remember shape and function are so important. So if it no longer has the correct shape, it will no longer bind the substrate, and it will no longer catalyze that reaction. So it will no longer make product X because your body already has enough of it. So that's an example of an allosteric inhibitor. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> here's another figure showing competitive inhibition. So here's a normal reaction that proceeds just as it should. Enzyme, substrate, active site, and then we have our products being made. But in competitive inhibition, this inhibitor is going to actually bind directly to the active site. So it's going to directly compete with the substrate for that active site. So that active site is no longer available to the substrate 
the substrate can no longer get in there and it can no longer be turned to product. So this is an example of competition. It's competing for the active site. Non-competitive inhibition would be if the inhibitor were to bind to an allosteric site. And another thing that affects enzyme function is the environment. So enzymes are specific or sensitive to the environment they work in. If there's any change to pH or temperature, that could possibly denature the enzyme. Uh, denature simply means to lose shape. And if the enzyme loses its shape, you got it, it loses its function. So here's an example. Up here we've got enzyme activity, and over here we've got pH. So pepsin, which is a digestive enzyme, likes to work in a low pH. So this is a very good functioning protein at a low pH. If it gets too low, it goes down in function. If the pH gets too high, it goes down in function. And you can see the same with salivary amylase and alkaline phosphatase. They have very narrow ranges of pHs where they work best. So they're sensitive to their environment. Now, we're going to do a lab in this class, a very cool lab about enzyme activity. So it'll be important for you to understand how we measure enzyme activity. There are two ways we could do it. We could measure substrate concentration. And so this is this graph here. So as the reaction proceeds, we see that the substrate, substrate concentration is actually starting to level off because it's being used up. The enzyme is doing its thing and the substrate is being turned into product. There's not enough substrate anymore. So the reaction is sort of leveling off. Okay, The enzyme has no substrate to use anymore, so the reaction levels off. Or we could look at time on the x-axis and product formed on the y-axis and see how product formation happens over time. So initially we have a very high rate because we have a lot of substrate, we have a lot of enzymes working, we're good. But eventually that product formation is going to level off because we run out of substrate. So two ways to measure enzyme activity. I've got four final questions for you to answer in your notes, so take a look at these and we'll check these in class uh, when you turn in your video notes.